आई वी एम वेलकम टू बीनीथ द फोर्स द विशाल गोंडल शो इन माई ऑन्टरप्रिनोरियल जर्नी ऑफ ओवर ट्वेंटी इयर्स आई हैड द प्लेजर ऑफ नोइंग इंट्रैक्टिंग एंड बींग फ्रेंड्स विद सम ऑफ द मोस्ट अमेजिंग सुपर अचीवर्स ईच वन ऑफ देम हैव अचीव सक्सेस इन दियर फील्ड बाई हार्नसिंग देयर नॉलेज पैशन एंड वेल्थ एंड हैव बिकम द फोर्स ऑफ गुड इट टेक्स इयर्स फॉर वन टू बिकम इन ओवर नाइट सक्सेस आई एम ट्राइंग टू डी कोड वॉट दे डिड सो डिफरेंटली इन दीज इयर्स टू बी वेर दे आर टूडे My guest on the show is Devyanshu Ganatra, a solo paragliding pilot, a scuba diver, a marathoner, a trekker, and now a high altitude cyclist. And I forgot to tell you one important thing: he's absolutely blind. Devyanshu, welcome to the show. Thank you, Vishal. Good to be here. Awesome. I hear that you are embarking on a big mission this year. with a few other blind people and uh, tell me more about it so yeah i'm excited about the expedition that we're doing in july august this it's called it's called m2k m2k which is a cycling expedition where we'll have uh, seven blind cyclists on a tandem cycle we'll have uh, three amputees and one person with a spinal injury uh, who's a paraplegic who will all ride from manali to khardungla a distance of about 550 kilometers to the world's highest motorable road wow and all these people are doing this for the first, I mean, of course you have done this before but all the other people are doing this for the first time yes everybody is doing it for the first time and and how does it work are they cycling alone or there is somebody with them how does this entire event work it's an inclusive cycling expedition uh, so you have tandem cycles for the blind so you have a sighted captain who uh, navigates this the cycle and you have the blind as a stroker who they and they work together as a team and and what what is this cycle is it a special cycle where do you get this from so this is these are called tandem cycles um, these are meant for two people these are uh, synchronous cycles so you have to pedal together you have to work together one person can't ride this cycle you need two people and um, unfortunately we don't get these cycles in india we have to import them get them made there we are the first to launch tandem cycling as a sport in this country it's interesting because usually cycling is a solo sport but with this it no longer is a solo sport it suddenly becomes a team sport so, so so let me put this in perspective you are actually getting a tandem cycle in which two people ride with one able bodied person the pilot and the second person on the cycle is either blind or paraplegic or you know some kind of disability and they are going to be riding this for how many days you said so uh, first of all only the blind will be on the tandem okay uh, the amputees will be on regular solo cycles mtbs okay they can be single amputees or multiple amputees mm-hmm. and the person who's a wheelchair user the the person who's paraplegic they have a special cycle which is called hand cycle oh wow and is designed for these terrains so this also is imported from the from the us currently are about 32 cyclists including able bodied solo support cyclists mm-hmm. the captains the the blind strokers the amputees and plus of course you have the support staff and this starts from manali and in how many days do you reach khardungla 12 days reporting is on 29th of july to manali we flag off on the 30th and on the 9th of august we should be on the top of the world the same thing repeats for second batch starting from 12th of august to 24th of august and and this is literally at the highest motorable road in the world that's where you're going what is the height over there so like 18000 or 18350 18350 feet so you're literally doing an extreme sport and then you're doing it on literally the highest motorable road in the world and you are taking blind and other differently able people are you crazy i mean why are you doing this i believe everyone can and the problem is that you you get overwhelmed when you think of it as 550 kilometers you think of it as 18350 feet um it's very overwhelming i agree these are tough terrains i agree it's tough it's not easy but break it down 
break it down. If I tell you, can you do 50 kilometers a day? What would be your answer? Like, be? All I can tell you is that most people listening to this show have, have never even ridden a cycle for a few kilometers. It's insane. I mean, I can't even think about it. But that's what makes it fun because there is a challenge to it. Um, there are many variables, but there's, there's an element of challenge. There's an element of risk. How do you go ahead and convince somebody who is blind to do this? There are many people out there who, especially in my community of persons with disability, who want to do adventure sports, who want to go, get out there, but don't have any opportunities. And, and, and how do you convince them that hey, this me, is an opportunity and they should for, be doing this? I just have to present the opportunity and then talk them through it. So nobody ever came to them and even presented an opportunity like this? Never before. In fact, most of the world has constantly told them, you can't do this. If you're blind, you can't, you're not even allowed in a swimming pool. How do you train for this? So the training has started almost four months, five months before. We pair them with pretty good cyclists. How do you convince them to do this? I don't really have to convince them because I believe and uh, I believe it's an amazing experience. All I tell them is, this is what we're going to do. This is an amazing experience. This is my experience. And then just explain the process to them that what is expected of them, what is expected there, what can they expect. And what does this training entail? What do they do in the training? So the training would begin with orientation. The training would begin with understanding disability, uh, getting to know the tandem cycle, getting to know their partners, and then simple, just riding together. So the captain and the stroker ride together. They practice together. They do this as a community. And over time, they barely even have to communicate verbally. They get to know, I get to know my captain so well that I know when my captain's tired, when I need to push, when the captain knows when I'm tired, when we need to shift gears. I know when a bump is coming. There's lots of things happening on the cycle. It's very dynamic, but we understand all of this completely non-verbally. Because on those altitudes, you've got to save energy. You can't keep talking. <laughs> you can't keep telling me left, right, whatever. You can't keep doing it. And then you ride like half a day, the whole day. When do you rest? Is it like a resting period also in this? Or? So on an average, we ride about 50 kilometers a day, which is not much. Roughly, we start at 7 in the morning. We should get there. So I've done this last year and I did it in eight days. Mm-hmm. This time we're going to do it in about 11 it's days. So okay. yeah. So it's it's much easier this time. 50 kilometers is not very, very difficult. You have all day. Mm-hmm. So you start in the morning, you can keep your pace, take your time. And even if you get there by about one thirty two to the next campsite, you're still in good time. No, no, I mean, this is absolutely amazing. It's scary as well as inspiring in a, in, at the same time is one of those things. Uh, I know, you know, this is going to cost a bob. So how are you raising money for this? I know I contributed to it yeah. on your crowdfunding uh, uh web page and we put that link for others uh, on the comment section but how are you raising money for this adventure sports of this nature the biggest challenge is to raise funds so we put up a crowdfunding link outlay is roughly about 18 lakhs that we have to raise and uh, firstly thank you for your contribution no no i mean that goes a long way i had to support this in any case i mean this is so amazing what you're doing so people can contribute Anywhere, for, for me, even if somebody contributes 200 rupees to it, I still would respect them the same as somebody contributing 2 lakh rupees. Companies can come forward or organizations can come forward and sponsor some of the things, like somebody can sponsor the gear, maybe somebody can sponsor the travel, maybe somebody wants to sponsor t-shirts, whatever, or psych, anything. So, so tell me something, how does an event or an adventure like this changes the life of a disabled person? One of the reasons why we do adventure sports or outdoor sports and set up our not-for-profit called Adventures Beyond Barriers is because there are millions of people who are persons with disability in this country. I mean, it's like some 30, 40 million people in India alone, right? Way more than that. Way more more than than that. Wow. So we don't have the exact numbers. But if you go by the world statistics, you go by the world averages and you do some math, the number is roughly about 200 million people with disability. 200 million people, that's almost 20% of our population. 15, yes. 15, 20, 20%. 15 to 20%. So what, what the world statistics say is that any given developing country has roughly about 15% population which has some form of disability. 
you have such a large community of people with disability and we are the largest invisible minority population in the world you haven't seen anybody you don't know anybody personally you don't have a single friend with a disability you didn't go to school with somebody with disability you didn't you don't see us in restaurants you don't see us in cinema houses or um workplaces or public places so you just never realize that this whole population exists and uh, there is a lot of shame and stigma associated with disability in this country so so we're going to talk about the disability issue in detail but my mm. question to you was that why adventure sport i mean why not train them to become skilled and you know there are other things let's figure out a way to get them employment there are you know you hear of all these other initiatives which is around training these people and you know getting them jobs etc you know why would you want to you know use all your resources to make them do adventure sports well simple there are two reasons one because i love adventure sports <laughs> well that that's a good start <laughs> yeah and so there is a selfish reason there but i also believe that while it's important to train them in skills like vocational skills while it's important to educate them all those are important things but the most important thing is your mental attitude mm-hmm. and adventure sports and outdoor sports offers you an opportunity to really work on yourself work on your attitude work on your mental strength on your self esteem on your confidence on so, your so motivation you, so, so you are taking people with very you know who have literally very limited resources and confidence and you're directly taking them to the top of the world literally yeah. in that sense yeah, because after that they're invincible they come back and they can generalize it to almost anything in life they know that if they can do this they can do anything that's an that's an amazing way to look at it right i mean so do possibly the most extreme thing you can and then all the other things seem very very easy so that's literally what you're pushing them to do absolutely so so let's start so with, uh, i'm going to give you an example so i i so vividly remember this uh we also run marathons etc and uh, i remember this girl we we were training this bunch of blind people to start running marathons So we let train. me let me repeat blind people to start running marathons why not you need feet to run you don't need eyes to run well but there's a huge crowd and you know there are all these roads there are khaddas on the road i mean how do you navigate just the way you do and do you tumble down you pick yourself back up again and there's pushing and shoving even otherwise so somebody shoves me i shove back big deal <laughs> well, i never thought <laughs> and, about it back <laughs> and uh, and also we we pair them with sighted allies okay so every blind person is paired with the sighted ally and they run the marathon together so you just like helping me see or navigate but otherwise we're running together and we're doing it together and apart from marathons you're also taking them for treks yes isn't that crazy right i mean you know when you're trekking there are stones there are you know you can just slip one wrong feet and you could be tumbling down the hill all these things can happen and that can happen in your city too in fact i've never had an injury in the mountains we only had injuries in I've, the city i've had most injuries in the city never once in the mountains well it said that crossing the road is more dangerous yeah, than exactly. climbing mount everest Absolutely. that's what kuntal who was uh, in the show last time told us so you <laughs> i are, agree you're literally taking that example even for uh, people with disabilities yes because while i'm walking in the city there are all kinds of ditches that appear out of nowhere I mean yesterday it was a nice smooth tar road somebody came last night dug up a deep hole and that's my death trap or you have uh, billboards at my face level so i smack my face i have uh, wires at my neck level so i'm practically dangling by those wires uh, branches coming out of nowhere you have a uh, uh, dog poop people don't clean after their dogs um thank you so much but dog uh, owners please yes please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all kinds of things so there are there are risks anyways no i, I understand and, there are and, risks right and and you taking this risk yourself is great but i still don't know it's difficult for us to convince healthy people to do these activities right absolutely normal people try convincing them to go for a trek try convincing them to cycle or do any of this it's difficult and how are you managing to convince differently able people people with disabilities to opt in for things like this how are their families taking this oh it's not easy it's not easy which just like your mainstream community has people who are 
uh, who don't want to do adventure sports or who think it's too risky. There are able-bodied people whose parents say, no, 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 my, my, my son or daughter will not go climb a mountain. Similarly, even in the disability community, it's no different. The first thing is deconstruct disability. What is, how do we define disability? Disability. And so, uh, disability. way to not do, not able to do something. But if I enable you to, will it remain a disability? Absolutely no. So, so you see, disability is not a physical thing. It's, it's a social construct. It's the way we've designed the world. So the only disability is the one in the mind and the way the world is designed. My handicaps come from the fact that this world is not designed for somebody who is blind. It's not designed for somebody who's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Because if it was, my disability never comes in the way at all. So I think it is, it is in a way the society labeling a set of people that you can't do this. More than labeling the society not creating equal opportunities. No, I mean, which it's, cause, it's because they think yeah. they, can't, they can't do it, right? I mean, Correct. nobody can, so, could even thought about a blind person going and doing parasailing, right? I mean... So now this, this is the stereotype, right? That you decide for me as an able-bodied person that I can't do this. So when I went for rehab, that's exactly what, what happened. That when I went blind, they told me all you can do is make cane or cane furniture or chalk. So, so tell me something I mean, before we get into your rehab and other things. Before, Give me an example. Tell me how did you convince a person and their family to mm. opt in for a tandem set? Tell me the story. How did you do it? Talk to the person. No, no, I, I'm, I'm talking about then, not. Then I'm, also I'm, I'm asking to, for a concrete example. Yeah. I'm saying, give me an example of a person, or not in tandem cycling, in anywhere, you know, where you had to mm. go from scratch, and it was the most toughest for you to convince them. To okay. Opt in for either running. Or yeah. Okay. So there, there, there's two girls, and uh, out of family of seven, five are blind. They come from a pretty disadvantaged background economically. And the father believes the girls are just meant to do house chores. Because anyways, they're blind. So what good are they? And these two sisters were to fight to keep them getting education. Their father was convinced that it's no good to keep them in college. Then we convinced these girls, why don't you come for a run with us? And they were happy to come for a run. And they came for a run. And we saw that they were really doing well. We started getting them to train a little bit. And there was a marathon coming up. So we said, why don't we participate in a marathon? We'd like to. The girls, both of the sisters jumped at the opportunity. They said, absolutely, we would love that. But our parents are not going to, my family is not going to allow. And this is a marathon. So we and had to go and talk to. This is what, 42 kilometers? 20 oh, no, no, no. This was 10, 10 kilometers. And uh, we went and talked to her parents and we said, we really would like them to do this. We will take care of them. We will be responsible. This is how, where we'll go. This is who they'll be with. All of that. Very reluctantly, the father agreed. Very reluctantly. Interestingly, these girls were phenomenal. Their first marathon, they timed 52 minutes in under 10 k. 52 minutes. Even I can't do 52 minutes. 52 minutes. And they started getting podium finishes. They started, their, their timings was better than professional marathoners. No, no, absolutely. I mean, 52 minutes for a 10K is, is amazing. Uh, so, so what started happening was, first professional marathoners used to say, oh, we have to pair up with a blind girl. Oh, how slow will we need to run? <laughs> no, it's how fast. And now it was exactly the reverse question. We're like, ah, no, 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 no. Can no. you run this? Can you run this? What's your personal best? And they would say, oh, 10 kilometers, uh, it's one or five minutes. I'm like, mm, add five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and I'm like, sorry, sir, you don't qualify. And they're like, what? What do you mean you don't qualify? I'm like, yeah, you're too slow. Like, what do you mean too slow? I'm like, yeah, my girls are running in 52 minutes. That started happening. So we had really, really excellent quality runners. And then they started getting their personal best. They started uh, talking about these girls on news channels, talking, dedicating their Boston marathons to these girls, getting these trophies, getting medals. And all this started going back home. That when the when the father saw all these trophies, when the father saw their daughters in the news, in print, in TV, the next time around, we we had a marathon. We had to we have, we have to get there very early, so three o'clock in the night we have to leave. Three o'clock in the night he comes and says, "Make sure my daughters run well today. Mm. Take good care of them, but make sure they run really well." The 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 only sad ending to this story is that the girl I'm talking about died at the age of 21 because of cancer. But she did not die as a blind girl. She died with an identity as a runner. And she had hundreds of runners who had come to wish her well. 
when she died of cancer because she no longer carried that identity of a blind girl. That's really, really powerful. I think you literally changed their life and lives of all the other people you are touching with your amazing initiative. So, so before we go deep into that, let let's let's get to your story. You are nothing less of less than an inspiration to yourself. And uh, even when we spoke last, you told me that it, at the age of nineteen, one fine day, you could not see. Mm. Tell me what happened that day. I was diagnosed with the condition uh, known as glaucoma when I was about seventeen. I'd gone for a regular eye checkup because I thought I had got a number. Before that, I had no. Uh, trouble with my eye at all, and uh, for some reason the doctor, on a hunch, on an absolute whim, decided to check my eye pressure on a crude instrument. The eye pressure turned out to be very high, and uh, he asked me to, my dad, to get some more diagnostic stuff. When we did that, it was confirmed that I have a condition called glaucoma. So this is when you were seventeen. This is when I was seventeen. The diagnosis was handed to me literally like this. The the doctor kept looking at me for about fifteen twenty minutes, peek, poke, prodded, said nothing at all, no word. And about twenty minutes into it, he just looks at me, says, "You are going to go blind." And I'm like, "Really? Because I ain't going blind. There's no way I'm going blind because I can see perfectly well. What the hell? I don't have any symptoms. I, there's nothing wrong with my eye." Why would I go blind? And he says you have a condition called glaucoma, and it's like a ticking time bomb, and we don't know when. And and there are no medicines. There's nothing you could have, or some surgery, or nothing could have been done that time. So there is medication, but the medication is not curative. The medication is preventative. So it's only to prevent or manage the condition. And in high pressure glaucoma, which was in my condition, my my condition was high pressure glaucoma. My pressure was almost seven times that of normal. Seven times, six to seven times that of normal. So it was very, very rampant. So I was on sulfur drugs. I was taking like four Dimox tablets a day sometimes. Uh, eye drops. Uh, I went through surgery. All of that. And uh, until nineteen, I had lost about fifty percent of my sight. However, um, even with fifty percent of your remainder sight, it's a lot of sight. It's enough sight to fool yourself and to fool the world. So I was still driving around. Not that I recommend, okay. but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was still driving around, and uh, it's not difficult actually. Well, especially in Pune, I can tell oh. you that people, everybody, <laughs> they ride on the wrong side of the road. So yeah. The right <laughs> so, um, and then at, at nineteen, one morning, I just woke up, and I, and that fifty percent, I lost overnight. And when I woke up blind, I I thought I was. I'd woken up in the middle of the night, so I thought I should go back to sleep. Well, a couple of hours later, I get up again, and it's still dark, and I'm like, "No way, this is why can't I see anymore?" And uh, I knew my study table, I knew exactly the things that were there, and I bent down to to really see if I could see, and I kept bending down until um, there was a candle on a candle stand, and that the wick of the candle poked my eye. I'm like, God damn it! I did not see that wick. I mean, that that's the moment when I really it hit me that I'm gone blind. That was the moment I realized what it means to be blind, because you can close your close your eyes and walk around and all of that, but that is not blind. Blindness is when you have your eyes open and you do not have the choice to see. And who was the first person you called? Interestingly, I tried to pretend. Because my pa- I, it was too much of a traumatic thing for my parents also. Although they were from, I mean, they were they knew someday it would happen. A brain, I guess, puts you in denial because it's too shocking or it's too traumatic. So it doesn't process it. So I never told anybody. I just walked around pretending to see. I knew my house very well, so I could walk around. And well, they figured it out because one day I was addressing the. I guess it was the next day or something, and uh, so for one full day, you didn't tell anybody you had gone blind. I never told anybody. One full day. They just they just figured it out. Maybe they figured it out sooner or later, but they just figured it out. I never told them I can't see anymore. I addressed the chair as dead. I was talking to the chair. And all of nineteen. I mean, this must be quite a shock to you. It was. Um, 
it's traumatic there's no other word for it it's traumatic it's mm-hmm. depressing it's um you feel angry you feel uh, it's 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 not easy it's it's a very difficult transition so so once your parents came to know about this once you came to know about it, how did you start dealing with this initially of course there's just depression or just i just hang just do nothing sit around mop around the the more unfortunate part is you you lose your friends also it's not just my side i lost i lost my friends too because and i don't blame them i guess that happens because they just didn't know how to deal with me anymore because these are a bunch of boys i would play cricket or go on the mountains or cycle with them and uh, and i could no longer do these things with them so if i'm in the part of the conversation and they're discussing about going up a mountain i would assume that we i'm included and then i'm all ready to go only to realize nobody's coming for me and then slowly realize that you never were included in that plan because well they don't know how to take you and and when this happened what was the reaction of your college and you know your school and teacher and principal how did they handle this so i i essentially quit college but i had quit college slightly before that because i was studying commerce i done my 12th prelims i still remember the day i was reading uh, dm mithani is a economics book by dm mithani mm-hmm. i so vividly remember that day i was reading that book and i said this ain't education i can't be reading about how many mangoes one needs to eat before you feel the 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 12th mango is worse than the first mango and the 11th is a little worse than that in diminishing marginal utility and i'm like crap man yeah. 12th mango is just as awesome <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like this is education because i'm just just not getting anything out of this so i just threw the book out of the window and i said i'm quitting education if this is education and and what happens once you are you know once you go blind is there some kind of a therapy i mean what happens how do you start dealing with it? is there a process i mean the professional thing to do or or the, the right way right approach would be to get some rehab and counseling and get to learn how to live independently as a blind person mm-hmm. it's not the end of the world and a couple of months into my blindness i decided my parents and i decided that it would be why is for me to go and check myself in a rehabilitation center for 6 months and learn the ways of the blind because you really have to relearn everything from putting toothpaste on a brush which is quite a task trust me uh, especially when you're blind and sleepy and i thought maybe the rehab center will teach me that so and and, and you are the only son or you have other siblings in your family i have an elder sister your sister yes so it was not just your parent it was your sister also who must be like really traumatized with this episode absolutely absolutely it was it was a very very difficult time as a family so i check into the rehab center and uh, what happens there is very very interesting so this is what happened there so as soon as i check in i'm shepherded into this room along with other newly blinded people who most of them are come from disadvantaged backgrounds and uh, the first thing that hits me is the stink of the smell the smell is terrible the whole place is stinking and i'm like come on my nose is working all time this place stinks can we do something about this the same room is where we were served food the way we were served food is you have chapati thrown at you literally thrown at you and the rule is simple if you can grab him you can eat him this is no way to treat a human being i really really felt that they did you know that that i had lost my sight and not lost my dignity and none of these people had lost their dignity and then i was taken for counseling code and code counseling and and you have this whole um round table full of some small words and uh they they kind of started talking to me and and i said what can a blind person do to stand on his own two feet what do blind people do i did not know a single blind person up till that i was the only blind person i knew not one single blind person and i go to rehab and they're coming out of the woodworks i mean there's just blind people everywhere and this is what they tell me at counseling i'm like what can a blind what do blind people do for a living and they're like what are you going to teach me and they say well we're going to teach you how to make cane furniture and i'm like mm, nothing wrong with it 
but you've heard of Neil Kamal, right? 20 years ago, Neil Kamal made, made a big splash. Mm-hmm. I'm like, nobody's going to be using cane furniture anymore. Everybody's going to move to plastic. And then they said, we'll teach you to make chalk. Again, come on, guys. Chalk. <laughs> no future in it. There must be something better. And then they do all kinds of whisper, whisper. And, and then they come up with this, yes, we have this course for you. It's a six-month course, and we will teach you how to become a telephone operator. Like, for real. Six months. All you've got to do is punch in a number and say hello, which I already know. So what are they going to teach me for six months? We know you didn't do any of that. And you yes, ended up becoming, uh, having a major degree in psychology. Psychology was still far away. Before that, what, what I asked them was, what are my choices? They said, these are your choices. I said, 20 years ago, IT was very, very hard. Everybody was talking about computers. I said, why can't I do something in computers? Why can't I make a career in computers? And they said, are you gone mad? So like the mental rehab is next door. I'm like, come on. <laughs> so you actually... So they said you got to learn computers. I wanted to do something that in which I could make a good career. And there's nothing wrong in making... In, and this was like late 90s. Yeah. Like 1997, 98. Late 90s. 93, 95. 95. 95. Yeah, 95. Around 95, yes. And they're like, you're blind. How are you going to use a computer? You've got to accept reality. These were the words. You've got to accept reality now. And this is your reality. You are blind and you've got to accept that. I said, I accept I'm blind, but this is not my reality. Why wouldn't, why can't I do computers? And they said, you can't. I said, you don't decide for me what I can or can't. So clearly the system completely failed you. And I don't think so. The system was designed to reach your vision and your goal. How did you do that? Well, I quit rehab. (laughs) <laughs> that's the best thing to do quit rehab quit rehab <laughs> if anybody is listening the worst thing to do is rehab quit rehab and then so how did you take one hour of your own life so that that one hour probably taught me way more and and the best thing was when I came out of rehab after an hour my parents were still sitting so outside you didn't go into rehab I was there for an hour and, and I had checked in for six months that counts. Um, but, but the best part of this whole thing is my parents were still sitting outside and I'm like, what, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, what took you so long? And I can't ask for better supported parents than that. They let me decide for myself. Hats off to your parents. I think uh, they probably were your absolute backbone which kind of let you get here. 100%. More than 100%. And when I stepped out of that rehab, I thought, okay, I'll go to some coaching classes there are lots of these training institutes, mushrooming now, and maybe they'll teach me computers. None of them had thought of a blind person coming and asking them if they can teach computers because here I am asking them to teach me computers when you can't see the screen. And they're like, but you can't see the screen. I'm like, yes, I can't see the screen. Bit of a technical problem, yes, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> so uh, how did you learn computer? How do you code or how do you program without looking at the screen? I buy hearted the whole damn thing. And this is so in, 19, just, in the late 90s, yeah, you were using a 486 and, yeah. and 586 and Pentiums. And my, my pride was my 500 MB hard drive. Oh, wow. 500 MB was yeah. a big hard drive. That big. Time. Seagate. Seagate. Yeah. And um, I said, well, if nobody's there to teach me, I, I still got a brain on my shoulder so I can teach myself. And everybody around me was still sighted, right? So mm-hmm. that's the first prototype of a human screen reader grab them and make them sit beside you and read the damn screen. I will learn. It doesn't matter if you don't know computers. So you used to type DIR yeah. and directory used to appear yeah. on your DOS. So I would know, absolutely. So if I pre- if I thought I had pressed something wrong, I would start all over again. And how many times you've accidentally deleted your work? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that I would be very careful with. But I have crashed systems and I've done all kinds of things. But that's the best way to learn. I feel so the best you way learn to learn. Coding? You learn coding? I, what I started doing was, uh, started doing coding, uh, in, in but very, language were you learning coding? so I, I did C, C++, and then Windows 3.11 came, and then I started learning about communications technology, so that's what I started doing. And you must be using Word and Lotus 1, 2, 3. Lotus 1, 2, 3. Yeah, that was the time when yeah. Word Star and all these things were there. Then they would, you would, Debase. Yeah, Debase. Debase 1, yeah. 2, 3. Yeah. So all of those. Wow. And uh, you're reminding me of my days using computers. But that's such ancient technology now. I mean, yeah. so ancient. So ancient, yeah. So, but we had to start from there. But that was incredible because 
my first break came from data Pro information technologies limited if you heard of email boxes and there was to be even before the internet came in we were setting up email communication email boxes so just like post office boxes people could actually come and collect email. their mails wow. through uh, these private post office boxes that are collected that, that that they can rent out so this is before vsnl launched their email correct so uh, i started working in uh, with data pro information technologies and setting up this communication this is the canodias right the the guys who own data pro i don't know i never worked with the, the owners i worked in this organization and uh, as a consultant if you heard of zmail yeah yeah of course yes so zmail i was part of i was working extensively with zmail and uh, then we snl and then uh, it is dish net happened then we started working on ocr and uh, ocr technology with cdac and ileap It, it got candid. Yeah, but bad. this is the language version, right? I leap also, so the Lippy they also had Lippy. Hmm, yeah. Correct. So, but this was also part of the OCR engine and the uh, text-to-speech engine, all of that happening at the same time. So, I started working in that. I spent about six years in uh, in IT. How do you used to actually use your computer without reading the screen? So, about a year, year and a half later, roughly, Windows three point one came, and with it came JAWS. which is job access with speech this is a screen reader that reads out the entire screen to me so for the first time i could start using the computer completely independently and this technology completely absolutely liberated me wow so technology is the one which actually came back to you, to help you absolutely because now i no longer needed anybody to read my reading and writing came back and that's a phenomenally powerful tool to have And, 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 and then, as part of that, what all projects were you involved in? So I was in, involved with a lot of internet-related projects. I was related with a lot of hardware. Uh, I was doing a lot of hardware work. So computer hardware is very, very like Lego. It's, you it's, have all those PCBs which were supposed to put in the slots. Absolutely, nothing fit the wrong place. Yeah. So it was the perfect thing for the blind. Actually, so you actually assembled computers. Right? I have I assembled computers and all of that. And back then, it was all about assembling computers. Yeah. Nobody went out and bought a branded. So there computer. was a power supply. Used to buy the motherboard. They used to buy the VGA card and mix match everything yeah. in the price and everything is a mix match and you just fix it together. The interesting thing is nobody even today opens their computer if something's wrong. Well, I have opened a lot of my computers. Most people don't. Yeah. Most people are scared of looking what inside and then they look what inside and they get very scared. And it's not scary. It's actually very very simple. So, 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 so tell me something. Aren't you an outlier? Is, is it you know possibly why the rehab centers want to not you know make people learn computers or make them do adventure sport? Is because they consider you an outlier and think this is not what everybody can do. It's an outlier. It's what everybody can do, but they don't want to empower. There are there are people who want to keep us disempowered because what will happen if? the entire community gets empowered then what happens to their organization that charities no longer charities will come so charity is just about humoring the person until the next day and this is not me this is oscar wilde who said it in 1871 that charity is a failed model charity is never about empowering somebody if you think about it africa receives the most amount of aid and has been receiving the most amount of aid for years together Forever, yeah. and nothing has changed because all that aid is charity The Vishal Gondal show will be right back after this break. In a world where people are busy playing mendicant at Diwali parties, two men decide to go all in in the river. Uh don't you mean on the river? On the river. Oh yeah. Two men will go where no one has ever gone before to a studio with no air conditioning or Coke Zero to talk about poker. Hey order lo na yaar koi kya hai ye bakwas? The SpartanPoker.com presents Mera Kaam Poker, hosted by Azim Banatwala, the best comedian in the world, according to himself, and Peter Abraham, not related to John. New episodes out every Wednesday on the IBM Podcast app or any other podcasting app you use. And for all our listeners who want to try out their hand at poker, you can log on to thespartanpoker.com, register yourself as a user with the promo code IBM. And you will get 200 bonus cash, which you can use to play poker for free. See you at the tables. So, so you decided to take 
your destiny in your hands rather than having somebody else control it and that first took you to learn computers yes get a career in computers yes and then what how did you get into psychology so i did computers for about 6 years and uh by then i had helped tra- set up training institutes by then i had worked with the government to frame it policy for accepting computer or it as a career viable career option for the blind and included in the list of the career options and i was doing quite well but i proved my point and while i was uh, doing it i was also starting to get into artificial intelligence and programming machines to do what the human brain does in terms of using it to empower lives and that's when i started reading up about the human brain and that fascinated me that was i believe my my first torrid love affair So cognitive science is really really exciting absolutely and i realized that it's such a marvelous piece of three pound flesh that we have on top of our shoulders but it's just so marvelous because what we take for granted the, the simplest of things to make a machine do it is so mm. complex so complex absolutely so so, so tell me something uh, you know since you are also in the cognitive space without having your brain to burden with sight which takes so much of your cognition power does it actually improve your other cognitive powers do you actually experience that so what happens is we are probably because 74% is your sensory modality so suddenly a large chunk of your brain's processing now your visual cortex is freed up in my case for example when when my visual cortex is no longer being used for visual processing the brain doesn't let the visual cortex just sit there idle the brain says you got to do some work man you're not going to sit there so it starts doing auditory processing so if you put my brain under the scanner my visual cortex would be doing functions that it's not designed to do such as auditory processing uh, memory all kinds of other things that it's not designed to do you know i actually seen you use your phone and you know use your uh, text to speech i mean that speech is so fast i can barely understand what they're talking and <laughs> you're processing everything but people read fast right so and and you read fast. fast or and as a matter of practice right over a period of time you start reading fast and start comprehending what you read so, so can you tell me a state uh, like a sentence how your ocr or your uh, your voice reader tells you how fast you like you want to like can you tell that sentence or oh, speak it and say yeah speak it and say i'm in the middle of some i so, didn't get it <laughs> you keep listening to it you get it okay. give it 18 years of uh just listening to it so so basically you can understand speech at literally 2x the speed yeah because speech is what i'm listening to all the time my screen reader is something that i'm listening to all the time practically from morning to night again so neural plasticity is something that happens uh it's it's very much something a brain is designed to do you also start developing your cognitive processes in terms of for a visual person if you see something or you read something you just remember where you saw it you don't remember the content because remembering the content would mean more cognitive effort in my case i may not have the choice to get access to that content again which means i have to remember it so you can remember phone number you can remember so if it's important to me i will remember absolutely so for example i do trainings and i meet people i remember names but that's because it's important to me and we all is growing up we used to remember so many phone numbers right yeah. Now we, we have lost to. it. Now we have lost that art because of the phone book. Correct, because of mobiles. Yeah, we used to borrow books from the library, and we used to borrow different books, and then we had to return those books. So we had to remember information, and we did remember information. Now all you remember is ah, Google did somewhere. So it's just the way we we now process information differently. So 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 which degree did you go and uh, get for psychology, and how did they enroll you for that? So yeah, six years later, I thought, well, I've done my. bit here in computers i'm done with it and i would like to go and really pursue psychology and mental health and study the brain and, and that should be easy i thought so i went to enroll myself back to college so here i was big almost back to school and um, they said you can't study psychology because you're blind i'm like whoa here we go again <laughs> <laughs> and they like oh, it's a science so apparently. i think when somebody tells you you can't do something that's your cue that i have to do this and oh, do it better man. than anybody else that's the word you should not use with me don't tell me you can't do something just be careful about using that word with me because if i really really want to i will spend the rest of my life doing it 
or trying to do it. So, so how did you convince the college to get you in that course? So there was a lot of back and forth, and then they said we have a rule. I said, excellent, and this is an old college, a like hundred years old college. I'm like, wow. You which which college is this? Ferguson College. Ferguson Pune. Okay, yeah. that's a big college. Yeah. And uh, I said, wow. So you mean to say, hundred years ago, somebody wrote that hundred years from now there will come a man who will be blind and will ask you for admission to the psychology department. Deny him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, come on, show me the rule. Because if you have such a rule... And what was the problem? Why couldn't we not have... Because experiments, uh, apparatus, how can a blind person do it? How will he work with patients? Blah, blah, blah. Total crap, if you ask me. But, uh, so, so how did you how did you they, get the turnaround? Because there was no such rule. Okay. Because I gave them two options. I said, show me the rule. If they're excellent, if you can show me the rule, it's time we change it. And if there ain't no such rule, there is no such rule. You just... Give me the admission. You have to give me the admission. And I drafted a legal sounding letter <laughs> at home. <laughs> <laughs> and the minute you send a legal sounding letter to any institution, they shit in the pants. And they're like, okay, fine. So after that, it was pretty good in Ferguson, no doubt about it. But when I went for my master's, there shit in the fan. Because half the staff wanted me there and the other half did not. Mm-hmm. And the half that did not want me there made absolutely clear that they did not want me there. But why? They just did not want me. They just did it. So this is what they told me on my face. You'll be no good. How will patients work with you? This is not a subject for blind people today. And you are wasting somebody else's opportunity and all that. And I'm like, whoa. And the person who told me this, that you will be no good as a therapist. I still respect him because he's a great researcher. He's a great scientist. He's a very senior theorist. And respectfully, I had to tell him this, that you're a great theorist, sir. But don't try your hand at therapy. I want to be a therapist, not a theorist. And they would like draw scatter diagrams on the board and say, Divya, aren't you want the scatter? Give us a solution. I'm like, give me the scatter, I'll give you the solution. They're like, not a problem. I'm like, not my problem either. Get out of class. Oh, no problem. It's the same outside as inside. <laughs> <laughs> or they would give me a D grade. I'm like, excellent. Because you know that I know you can't give me a F grade because if it fail me, it goes for re-evaluation to somebody else. And I know very well that I've not done so bad that I'll fail. So the best you can do is D, no problem. How did you end up the f- finally passing the course? Oh, I passed out very well with a B plus. Because you average it out, you still have the opportunity to get A's and O's in others, right? You average it out. B plus is not bad, right? Absolutely. Good. It's very good. And for me, my objective was to get the degree and get out of there. And after the degree, what did you do? I was the first to get placed for my badge. First to get placed? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and where did you get placed? Tata Service or Tata Business Services, TBSS, wow. Tata Business. And, and what was your role there? I was working as senior executive HR. Directly into HR? Huh? Yeah, all that happened. That happened by, people. and that happened quite by accident in a way because uh, I was invited at a, as a panelist to an MBA college, and uh, one of the uh, senior HRs from TBSS was also a panelist. He said, "Would you like?" He gave me an offer right there. He said, "Would you like to work with us?" I said, are you asking? I'm ready for the offer. I'm going to be finishing my course sometime soon. And I'll be happy to. And, and, you know, didn't they have a challenge? You know, you cannot see, you're blind. And, you know, how do you kind of cope up? And because companies, while they yes. say all these things yes. that we are open for differently able people. And, of course, now there is a different trend. But, yes. you know, 15 years, 10 years back, that was not the case. Yes. So, 2005, uh, when this happened, it wasn't the case at all. But... Um, Interestingly, it's the people that make the organization. Right? And the people in the decision-making capacity only ask me one question. We want to know how you're going to do your work and what will enable you to do your work. As long as you can get their work done, it doesn't matter to us if you do it with the eyes closed or your eyes open. And, and the decision-makers there stood by it. And they continue to be my mentors even today. They're amazing. So let's, let's just recap, right? You turn blind at the age of 19. You go into rehab, don't complete your rehab, get into computers, become very good at it and then suddenly get into psychology, finish your psychology course and get into the corporate world. After that, somehow you leave everything and get into adventure sports. Now, how did that happen? I mean, how, you know, I can still understand this part, but this whole thing of adventure, what connects adventure in your life? I mean, you know, what happened? How did you get into this? So I run two organizations. In 2006, I quit Tata's and I started my own organization. 
So I continue to work with corporates in behavioral facilitation, but I also have continued to be in adventure. So growing up, I was always climbing mountains or cycling or climbing trees or going under water. No, but that's and that's that pretty much, you know, as most young people do Correct. that. Right? But I always wanted to be in the mountains. I always wanted to, to make people fall in love with the mountains, with the outdoors, because I believe that only if you fall in love with something can you protect it. You can't read about it in books and go to the mall on weekends and then talk about protecting the environment. Mm-hmm. They don't know what environment. And that's all I wanted to do. And, and of course, I love sport. But when I went blind, that was the one thing that was very, very difficult for me to continue to do because there was no opportunities at all. So, and of course, there were other priorities that took over. So there were other things to do. There were other things to learn. And adventure sport took quite a back seat. And uh, when I managed to do other things, settle down in terms, quote unquote, settle down. I don't know what is settling down, but I started thinking back of going back to adventure sports. I started climbing mountains and I started getting a bunch of people together to uh, escort me through the mountains, who would escort me, guide me through the mountains, who would start doing stuff that uh, everybody does. Uh, because often they would say, oh, we'll pick this easy one. We'll pick this mountain. Why? Why we pick this mountain? Oh, it's easy. I'm like, why would you pick something that's easy? Oh, but then it's risky. I'm like, come on, you you guys are doing it. So let's figure out how to do it safely. But I, I don't want to do it just because it's easy. So, so, so again, an odd question. Since you anyway can't see, how what difference does it make whether it's an easy or a difficult mountain? Not for me, but for them. I'm not the one who's getting anxious. They're the ones who are getting anxious. You were, fine. you were fine doing any. I was absolutely fine. I trust you. You're, if you're my guide in the mountains, I will trust you. If you tell me to step somewhere, I will step exactly there and nowhere else. So, okay, this was all trekking in a way, mm-hmm. not mountaineering. Which, yeah. which so, was the... So, trekking, uh, even if it mean, meant climbing, rock climbing, that, whatever it is, that's where we... No, but what was the first serious adventure sport you did, which was like, which people said you can't do? So, about now, almost 10 years ago, when this whole adventure thing started coming back to me, what also came back very strongly was me wanting to fly. Because that was something I wanted to, to do. fly. As, yes, to fly. That was something that I wanted to do as a child, right from childhood. And I think everybody wants to fly. Everybody looks up to the sky and, and says, hey, it would be amazing to fly with the birds, right? And then you grow up and the world tells you you can't do it. And you start believing the world. I said, well, that's what I always wanted to do as a child. And that's amazing. That's fun. I want to fly. So why, why can't I fly? I thought that should not be that difficult. I started asking instructors and, and they started freaking out because they said, but you're blind. How can you fly? I'm like, what does blindness have to do with flying? And it took me seven years, seven years somebody. to find one instructor, one instructor who would believe and say, okay, why not? So I would ask, literally at the end of it, I would ask three instructors every single day, can you teach me to fly? And I want to fly by myself. I don't want a tandem. I don't want to, I want to learn how to fly by myself. But how, but how can you, do, I mean, how can you do that if you can't see the terrain? How do you fly by yourself? <laughs> so it's a myth that pilots fly solo. All pilots are looked after by a whole set of people. There's a whole team that's looking after them. There's, there's the ground control crew, there's the launch crew, there's, there's the ATC. There's the, for, for regular flights, there's the air traffic controllers. There are all kinds of people looking after the pilot. The pilot has the best seat on the house. But he's, he's constantly receiving so, radio communication. So we always used to hear the autopilot flies everything. So that's really what it is. It's everything is autopilot. In your commercial flights, practically, pilots are going to hit me for it. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you might as well have a blind pilot. Yeah. But then I don't fly commercials. Okay. Um, that's also because there will be no passengers who will want to fly <laughs> yeah. if they know there's a blind pilot. I fly gliders, which are non-powered aircrafts. So, so how did you get onto the first glider and which insane person let you? <laughs> so, so this is, this is the story of how it happened. So what started happening was over the time or over a period of time, I started getting a pattern and the pattern that I started noticing was that when I approached instructors or people, they would first see my blindness. The minute they saw my blindness, they would be very awkward. They would freak out. And my next question would be, would you teach me to fly? And they would be like, yes, yes. Or finally they would say no, because I would be persistent. Mm-hmm. So then I changed my tactic. I started calling people up. Mm-hmm. Now we're equals, right? They yeah. don't know I'm blind. Yeah. So I would ask all sets of questions and all of that. And this is what happened that day that I asked. So it was Anita, who's 
my instructor's wife and uh, she and my instructor Avi, they run a school together called Temple Pilots. It's, it's a flying school. And, and I and call her in uh, Kamshed. Kamshed, that's Kamshed, right. Yeah. By the way, I've been told to go there a number of times, but my wife just doesn't let me go. She's oh. like, no, you cannot do paragliding on your own. So I've not been has there. Your, has your wife, hmm, does she know that I fly? <laughs> well, after this episode, I'm sure she's going <laughs> to let me do it. Tell her if you're blind, well, I can. <laughs> so I think it is probably it's me same. more than my wife. I should not blame her. She's <laughs> anyway, so yeah. So Kamshed, oh, yeah. guys, is the best place for people who are listening. That's the best place, at least in India, for paragliding. Yes, yes. In fact, it's one of the top 10 places in the world to fly. And it's right here in my backyard. Yeah. Just uh, like an hour and a half from Bombay. Between Bombay and Pune. Yeah. And uh, so I call up and Aditya gave me the whole download of how to register for the course, what to expect, la, 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 la. And I'm like, great, can I sign up? And she's like, yes, you can sign up and you can start. And I'm like, excellent. Just one thing, I'm blind. <laughs> I hope that's not a problem. <laughs> Asterix, uh, yeah. I'm blind. <laughs> and Anita is like, uh, blind? Ha ha, what do you mean blind? I'm like, blind, as in blind, blind, can't see, zilch, blind. She's like, ha ha, good joke. I'm like, no, 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 no. I am blind and I want to fly. You just said I can sign up. And Avi happened to be there. Like I could hear Anita telling Avi, there is some guy on the phone. I think he's pulling my leg. He says he's blind and he wants to fly. And fortunately for me, Avi must have been in his, one of his bestest pilot moods. He gives her a thumbs up and says, yeah, sure. Why not call him over? <laughs> and Anita's yeah, like, like, what the hell is going on here? So she's like, okay. I come over. Come over tomorrow morning, can you? I'm like, yeah, sure, I can. The next day I go and uh, we have a nice long chat and uh, uh, both Ani, Abhi and Anita are there and uh, they understand my reasons for doing it and then we figure out how we'll go about doing it. It was never a no from them. It was never a no. For some reason that eludes human rational thinking, it was just a yes from the heart, from the word go. And um, that's it. We signed up and uh, first we decided we'll do it this way and we'll do it that way and we'll take this contingency and that and then finally we just dropped everything. We said we just do it the regular way. We just use radio communication and we just... So, so how do they tell you? How do you navigate on a flight? Every pilot gets radio navigation and you're radioed in. So I was getting radio instructions. The critical period, there are two crit- very, very critical periods. One is takeoff Other and the other is landing. landing. Yeah. Landing is more critical sometimes uh, because you have no engine. So there is no thrust. There are no second chances. Once you're locked into land, you're locked into land. Now you're going to land like a watermelon or you're going to land on your two feet. You're going to land safe, but you're going to land anyways. So they would give me altitude. So they would give me 50 feet, 40, 30, 10. And there's certain maneuvers you do as you keep coming down. Mm-hmm. And just before you hit the ground, you apply brakes and you cut your speed. Mm-hmm. And then how many flights have you done so far? So I've done one full solo flight mm-hmm. and uh, now I'll start my advanced lessons. So, and, and how many years? Me, yeah. yeah, sorry. It took how, me six months. Six took months. How much time for learning how to fly? Six months? Four days. Four days? Four days. Is that that fast? <laughs> Is that easy? And that easy? Yes. Uh, well, Aircrafts are designed to, to fly. That. I need to do that. Four days. You can do your first solo flight in four days. Amazing. It took me seven years to find an instructor. It takes me four, four days to learn how to fly. Wow. And you have a record to be now the, I think, India's first solo blind paragliding yeah. pilot. Yes. And after paragliding, what else did you do? Uh, then, of course, I climbed mountains and then um, you I started to a cycling. glacier also, right? Milan, yes. Yeah. And how, how high was that? Milan is about 16,000. 16,000. 16, 16, 16 or 17,000. Yeah. That was way back again. Milan was before my flying. Okay. Um, after my flying, then I started cycling, running marathons, doing scuba, uh, scuba learning scuba. scuba. Yeah, yeah, scuba. So tell yes. me about scuba, right? I mean, that's again one of those hardcore things which you have to train for. Yes. And... So scuba is something that is still work in progress because it's it's quite um, for me for me particularly uh, scuba is more difficult, quote unquote, because of my struggle with claustrophobia. Oh, you have claustrophobia. So I have claustrophobia. Uh, that's a that's a huge, huge thing to battle against. But when you're, how uh, do you have claustrophobia? Since you can't see, how do you know whether you are in a box or you're not in a box? 
the claustrophobia is not about uh, whether you can be claustrophobic even in this large room and you can be claustrophobic even inside the elevator. It's an emotion, like it's an, it's a buildup of anxiety where you start feeling trapped in, you feel you can't breathe. And I guess it's also underwater, I have very little control because I have no sensory perception. See, what happens is when I'm flying, I'm still using my senses, I'm still in you control. You can hear, you can... I'm still doing things myself. With scuba, the biggest thing you use, the biggest sense you use, or the only sense you would actually dependent on is your visual sense. And you take that away, what's left? And when you go underwater, what do you see? I mean, you can't... I can't see. It's an experience. It's extremely meditative. The fact that I can uh, just calm myself down, overcome my claustrophobia. So I have, I've also just slept for a few little, little while underwater. Literally gone to sleep for a couple of minutes. Take a nap. It's beautiful. It's very, very... So scuba is anti all adventure sports because it's, it's a lazy man's sport. The lazier you are, the more you'll enjoy the doing scuba. The more you'll do enjoy doing scuba and the more you'll stay underwater because you're consuming less oxygen. That's an interesting way to put it. So all the lazy people out here, <laughs> it's time to move your asses and do scuba <laughs> diving. Yeah. And after scuba, you did the your solo cycling, the tandem cycling yes. from which you did last year. Yes. Tell obviously. me more about that. So I've always loved cycling and... Um, Something that I did as a sighted person and then there were no tandem cycles here. However, I got one tandem cycle and uh, one of my friends, I started cycling and then one of the cycling friends said, Hey, you know what? Two months later, we're going to Manali to Khardungla. Why don't you sign up and come with us? Manali to Khardungla. Interesting. Why not? <laughs> then so I think like, the pattern is that we have to give you the most crazy challenge yeah. and you'll sign up for that. And, uh, I think if Elon Musk <laughs> is listening, we have a volunteer to go to Mars. <laughs> already here. The first blind volunteer. <laughs> so I talked to him. So, and so would you, by the way, sign up for a, for a trip to Mars if uh, you, were, you were offered Mars or Moon or one of those space trips? If you make it very touristy, then no. So you want to like do it really hardcore? I mean, do something. Where I get to do something and, and there's more fun maybe, and I mean, elements. Maybe we'll have another show yeah. only dedicated to that trip. <laughs> But yeah, I think that's the pattern, man. I mean, yeah. you are... There has to be know, a challenge. You are a superhero. You are truly a superhero. If there's no challenge, it's going to be boring. There has to be a challenge. You, you have to push you, your... But your you see standard. challenge, right? I mean, there is challenge coming to you and, you know, you... Or actually, in this case, challenges are seeking you and... I thrive on challenges. And every opportunity which helps me stretch myself, every opportunity that helps me raise the bar a little bit, I ask myself, what's the worst that's going to happen? The worst, fail. yeah, the worst is gonna be I'll fail, but that's no big deal. I fail all the time. Even if I fail, I can I can start again, right? And and I would never know if I have the potential if I never start. The fear of failure stops everybody from doing things which they are meant to do. But in your case, since you failed at every step, for you failure was the natural instinct, yeah. and you're like, how worse can it be than this? Absolutely. And and that's one thing that I really, really am happy to my school for because they failed me in kindergarten. <laughs> I mean, who the hell fails in kindergarten? Well, that's a good starting point. So, they were. I was in intensely academic school and they failed me in kindergarten. And I would have not remembered this, but I had very good friends. Oh, who kept reminding you. Absolutely. So, coming back to how I ended up cycling. So, this friend of mine signed me up. I'd never been there in that, that route. Here we were thinking of going in two months. About two weeks later, my friend says, I'm really sorry. I think I can't do this. So he cops out. <laughs> so your friend who actually invited you to do this cops out. Yes. Who was actually planning all the logistics and everything. So in my head, I was committed, right? I had signed up. So come what may now, I was going to do it. I decided to do the whole logistics and everything on my own and uh, go on this route. And that's what we did. And we did it in about eight days. And uh, interestingly, every single professional cyclist we met said this is not possible in under 12 days. You need 12 days to do this at least. You've got a long, long cycle. You've got 50% less oxygen. You've got five mountain buses. And uh, it's not possible. I think now we know the theme. Whenever the word impossible comes to you, you do it. But that was no, no. There, there it was not like that. My, my tickets were booked for nine days later. Simple as that. Okay. <laughs> So I had to get it done in nine days. 
and we did it in eight days. Okay. But uh, but what was more thing was that people just keep naysaying. But I mean, my point is that you know there are so many naysayers in the world, and there are so many people who don't do things because of some or the other excuse, you know. And in your case, it is literally that you know that you just needed somebody to tell you you can't do something, and you go ahead and do it. That too with a disability. But what kind of really is like you know completely inspires me is that how you are helping others to do it. I mean, doing it yourself is di- is different, right? You take your own risk, you decide on your own. But why is it important for you to get other disabled people experience this? It's simple because uh, the joy I get out of this, what what I derive out of doing all of this, is what I want to share, and for me. There's greater joy in sharing your joy. There's greater joy in sharing what you have. To see those transformations in front of you, this is what has changed my life. This is what has helped me. This is what enriches me. And why not make it accessible? Why not make those of same opportunities available to millions of people who have been told you can't do this? I'm in a position of privilege, and it's my duty to give back. It's it's a crime if you're sitting in a position of privilege and not do anything about it. and and there are so many people who have the resources to do exactly what you did and more but they still don't do it how do you not only get the mental strength but how do you get the financial resources to make this happen i work hard and uh, for me it's simple that if you're driven by purpose money is in, money is just a side thing money will come is your is your purpose very very clear Are the reasons why you're doing it clear? Is your focus clear? Is uh, are you authentic? Are you transparent? Money is very, very a, a, a byproduct. It it happens. It comes. So, so I'm sure the the people listening to the show and you know friends and other people they know or they know of somebody who is disabled. If we know of somebody like this, how can we help them connect with you and how can they start their transformation? So I run a not-for-profit called Adventures Beyond Barriers Foundation. Uh, I set this up about two and a half years ago, and we work with cross disabilities. So no matter what your disability, might be blind, blind and deaf, paraplegics, quadriplegics, amputees, they can get in touch with us, and we do a variety of adventure and outdoor sports. So from uh, summiting Mount Everest and doing treks to Everest base camps, to a lot of treks in the Sahyadris, rappelling, rock climbing. We do marathons across the country, triathlons, duathlons. We do um, tandem cycling, scuba diving, paragliding, all kinds of outdoor adventure sports. So whatever the person wants to do. And how, what do they have? To, they have to sign up. They or? just have to sign up. They just have to say they want to do this, and then we sit down with them, understand why they want to do it. We don't do it for any records. That's for sure. If you want to. do it because you want some record and do some guinness record and do some stunts that's not that's not what we do and and where could these people be based anywhere in the world anywhere in india any what is your absolutely they can be they can be anywhere in the world uh, some of the things happen here in pune some happen in up north some happen uh, in various cities so it it really depends so the very first thing we do is once a person expresses interest in a particular thing we first understand their needs we understand what all are their needs what is their disability and uh, what are the safety protocols we'll have to have in place so we, we put safety first and do they get some kind of certification yes they also get certification so for example you could be a paraplegic you could be an amputee but you could be pari certified and and how can able bodied people help you I mean, so once, of course, there are the disabled. So, Adventures Beyond Barriers is not just meant for persons with disability. We are an organization focused on persons with disability as well as able-bodied people to do adventure and outdoor sports together. And for us, inclusion is more important, and we do all our outdoor and adventure sports inclusive. So, so what is the purpose so, behind ABBF? Then? The purpose behind setting up ABBF is. is fundamentally very very simple if you ask me what is my biggest challenge as a person with disability today and what has been my biggest challenge over the past 20 years most people would think it's my blindness most people would think it's disability 
But you're absolutely wrong. The biggest challenge is not my disability. The biggest challenge are social attitudinal barriers that we face every single day. Those are the mountains we have to climb every day. These attitudinal barriers that we face do not stem out of malice or ill intent or because people are bad. They simply stem from the fact that the mainstream community doesn't know any person with disability. There's no contact. There's no awareness. There is no empathy. And empathy will build only when you really get to know somebody. Empathy is when you start discovering about each other. And for us, the best way to shatter these stereotypes, prejudices, misunderstandings, misconceptions, is get these two communities to come and play together. And, and is this a unique problem in India or this is a problem everywhere in the world? This is more unique in developing countries, more unique in, in a country like India, primarily because in India, there is still shame and stigma associated with disability. So many of persons with disability who are never introduced to the world. No, but I'm, I'm see. Being disabled and doing activity and working in computer programming is now getting normal still. But doing adventure mm -hmm. is still extreme, even yeah. in the US, I would say. Given the fact that they are yes. such a litigious society, nobody yes. will <laughs> let you do all of these things, right? Because of just the danger of getting sued. See, there is an element of risk in everything. All adventure sports, there is an element of risk. However, the element of risk for person with disabilities is not more than an able-bodied person because we ensure very high safety standards. We ensure adaptive equipment is in place. We ensure we have safety protocols. We have, we have trained instructors. So it's not that this is a misconception that simply because I'm a person with disability, I'm a high risk as an adventure sports. The, there is a slight degree of risk which is slightly higher than rest, but it's not that high. It's, it's really not bravado. It's really not uh, crazy suicidal. So this is adventure. This is not extreme sport. So I think that's the difference between what you're trying to put together. Like like when I'm flying, would, is that an adventure sport or an extreme adventure sport? Well, I will call it an extreme adventure sport since you can't see. But, but if I say that we've other ways, we've built our way around it so that my not being able to see does not matter. Then, then it's definitely safer. That's it. So we ensure safety in contingency. So for example, we had contingencies like, for example, if my radio failed, then what? Then we had a boombox. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody ran away with that boombox, then what? Then my instructor actually would shout out instruct instructions loudly. And then we would see how far that goes. And we try every method out. Now nobody can run away with my instructor's voice, right? <laughs> Absolutely. The Vishal Gondal Show will be right back after this break. Hi, I'm May and I'm a huge fan of the indie music scene in our country. A scene that's relatively underground, even though it sometimes speaks its head overground. But there's no shortage of talent and I get the privilege of interviewing some of the most awesome musicians on my show. I've had the likes of Euphoria, Kirsch Kale, Hardcore, Randolph Coria. I've had singer-songwriters, folk singers, electronic music producers, playback singers, rappers, fusion artists, instrumentalists, classical musicians, and so on. Whether mainstream or not, these people have chosen to release their original music and these are the people currently shaping the direction in which our music scene is heading. Join me on my show every Monday and tune in to discover the unique talent coming out of India today. You can catch Made in India on your favorite podcasting app or our very own IBM podcast app. So I think with ABBF, it's quite clear you want to help other people, both disabled as well as able-bodied to kind of come together. Yes. Now, in this mission of yours, how can people help? How can people contribute? So the very first thing to do is come and experience. Because when you come and experience, you discover so much about the lives of persons with disability as well as go back with the change perspective on your own life. You also realize that as individuals, we have such tremendous power to influence change, to make this world a better place. We've had CEOs and MDs of software companies, of large organizations who never even knew that I could use a computer. Of blind people can use computers. 
and they came on a trek or they came on a marathon with us and they they started talking to us they realized that this is what we do and they go back to the organizations and say hey you know what i mean these bunch of blind programmers why can't we hire them and they turn out to be more loyal employees and hundreds of employment opportunities were created just after one marathon or one trek for example there's this prominent builder from pune where i come from and all of 56 years old he comes and runs a marathon with us has built multiple buildings throughout his life he's been he, he was in the construction business for 36 years only to come and run with us to realize the importance of accessible infrastructure and when he learns about that he on that at the end of that marathon he says i promise you every single building from now on i will build will be made accessible and he's like i'm not doing it because it uh, it's a nice thing to do i'm doing it because it's the best business sense because it's not just for persons with disability it's great for persons who are temporarily disabled it's great for pregnant ladies it's great for children it's great for senior citizens it's great for everybody because you are changing people's mindset you are you are showing them the extreme and if you know people can do that you know programming and you know using a computer is much much simpler in that sense yes and it's about paradoxical giving people paradoxical experience so people come with this belief that oh blind people means this is this and then suddenly you're giving them this completely paradoxical experience now they no longer can hold their old belief that has to go away because now this experience is an evidence they cannot refute so i, I think i think the drive the point you are really driving is that as i as i said that the the disability is in people's own thoughts it's what is stopping them from doing bigger things in life and challenging themselves is their own inability to believe in themselves yes. and what you really do is help people discover that absolutely and in this whole process while abbf is happening and everything else is going on at your personal level what are your ambitions where do you see yourself 10 years from now uh for sure i see myself growing potatoes and tomatoes that's for sure i don't see myself you, you'll be a farmer i'll be growing my own food for sure okay producing my own uh i'll be producing what i consume i don't see myself seeing, living in a city so i i see myself living amidst mountains and about in the midst of nature and any other big adventure coming up in your mind you want to do oh no i want to travel the world on my cycle i want to make this world a better place so i want to see a lot more uh, persons with disability doing mainstream adventure sports i want to see all the adventure bodies in this country to be certified as disability experts so that they can take on more persons with disability i want to see schools in it i want to see the end of special schools i really really want to see the end of special schools i want a more inclusive world so i know recently the government has come up with a policy around disability and there are so many things happening around it so what are the good things out of it and what is still lacking and what would be your suggestion to the government to do actually from my perspective the govern government of course needs to work on legislation however it also needs to work on legislation with spirit because just having policies does not help being able to translate those policies at ground level is very very important protecting the rights of persons with disability is what the government can do in a big way and that's what they can do i think that's that's the most important is one thing they are working on is making at least the public infrastructure more accessible i know there is new buildings and other things are getting uh, you know wheelchair access and stuff like that that's all that's all happening now yes it's it's that's a good thing we have the accessible india campaign going on and uh, so there are bet- that at least we're moving in the right direction we still have a very very long way to go starting with getting the exact number of persons with disability in this country so when you don't have the exact number of persons with disability your policies are all meant for uh, uh, your policy decisions are skewed your budgets are skewed so starting from there we have a long way to go but at least we're starting somewhere so tell me uh, you know, we spoke about your plans for the next 10 years but more importantly 
what is the long term future of your organization where do you see abbf going in the next 10 20 years the long term vision of uh, abbf is to be able to scale it up because we're the only premier organization in the world doing inclusive adventure sports with the aim to create empathy with the, with the with the aim to create social transformation so we want to do this not just in our country but we have invitations to do this in Tahiti, we have invitations to start this in Africa, we have invitations to start this in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, and we would like to scale it up because these are issues that are universal. These are struggles of persons with disability across. We're seeing such amazing results and transformations in the past two and a half years with our work right here in this country that we would like to scale it up. And no, no, absolutely. I think, you know, this is one thing which can truly go global. So coming to your global ambitions, you are taking risks literally every day. Are you fearing death? Not at all. So what do you fear? Interesting question. Probably getting to see, getting my side back. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is your fear is that one fine day you'll wake up and get your side back. Yeah, and that'd be traumatic. Imagine what I'd see. Well, yeah, clearly the world is... <laughs> The way the world is going today, you don't want to see some of those things. You bet. <laughs> But uh, yeah, death, death is not such a big, not, not something that I fear about. That's a given and, and that's going to happen anyways, someday. I can't be thinking about it and be the living dead. Make the most of every moment you've got. On 4th December 98, I was declared dead. Technically, I had to be losses. My lungs had failed. And uh, I should not have been alive that day or the day after that, or the day after that. And uh, here I am, not just alive, but thriving. Wow, that's, that's, that's inspiring and that's amazing. But what I learned on that operating table was that uh, was, was the line from this book called Tuesdays with Mori, which came back to me. That line said, once you learn how to die, you learn how to live. And that day, I really, really learned how to live. And uh, every day is a bonus. So there's nothing to really worry about. So, so coming to your days, tell me what is a typical day in your life? What the, time do you wake up? The typical day in my life is there's no typical day. Every day is so unique from so, each so, other. But what is your ritual? What is your morning ritual? Morning ritual is just, I, I get up pretty early. Uh, I get up around 5-ish, 5.30ish. I have a beautiful terrace. So And you live alone? I live alone. Mm -hmm. I've been living alone for about 18 years now. Uh, I make myself a cup of chai and I spend some time by myself on the terrace. Uh, that's my heaven. And um, and then what's your about, typical breakfast? Can who we, makes and who makes breakfast? So I I make some breakfast or then I just um, I have a uh, cook or I make breakfast. And, and what is it? Or I have now a person right next door who who started this breakfast service. So I just order in. She makes homemade breakfast and homemade lunch. So I just order in because cooking takes time for me and I feel that's just a waste of time for me right now. No, what I mean to say is what do you actually eat? Is there a particular, are you... Whatever is available, but nothing, no no diet, nothing. They're so just poha or idli, what is your typical omelets? What Usually you poha, uh, uh, idli, upma, I hate now because I ate too much of upma. Uh, so I can't stand up anymore. And the omelets, bread, bread sandwich, bread cheese. Um, uh, and do you exercise? Yes, but not every day, as most people think I should be. But I don't. <laughs> Honestly, I don't exercise every day. I pr probably exercise about two or three times a week. And do you meditate? No. You don't meditate? I don't meditate. For me, going up a mountain, going for a walk or cycling is my meditation. That's my, and usually whenever there's a big thing coming up, like for example, now this cycling expedition is coming up. So naturally my training regime, my exercise, everything changes, my routine changes, uh, my diet changes. And, and, and you're telling me that you also have one of the largest collection of e-books. Oh yeah. So, so tell me more about that and which have been your favorite books and any books you recommend the people out here to, to read. Oh, there's one book I recommend every single person to read and that is The Little Prince. Mm -hmm. by Saint Antoine Exubery. It's a must. It's And an what's the must. book about? <laughs> um, hey, go read it. It's, it. A, Just it's, it's impossible to summarize it because every time I read it, every single time I read it, 
I find something new in that book. Also, it's all of 64 pages. So 64 pages, right? I think everybody and can read the little most, print. And, and it's full of illustrations and drawings, and but the most profound book ever. In fact, it's the second most largest selling book after the Bible. The Little Prince. The Little Prince by St. Antoine Exubery. I recommend that book highly. Well, I'm going to read that for sure. I don't know about the rest of the people. Uh, what is your most valuable possession? Any object which you bought, which you use the most? My most valuable possession would be my... The, the two most valuable. Okay. One's my laptop. Because it helps me read, write, connect to the world. So and which, which model is this? So this is a Dell laptop that I've just got. The other most valuable possession is my white cane. And, I and you have a special cane. I've seen that. You're showing me how different it is. Yes. So I have a roller tip cane. And uh, the difference between a roller tip cane and a regular white cane is that a regular white cane has a tip to it. And all you can scan is that much of a surface, just the tip. With a roller tip cane, you can scan the entire surface in front of you while you're walking. You don't need to lift the cane. So you actually understand all the undulations or if there are any um, ditches in the road, you scan the entire surface in front of you. So, so it's much for, better. for all the blind people out there, you need to move from your regular canes to the roller tip canes. And can you get these canes easily? You don't get them in India, but you can order them from Ambitech for about $35. Oh, it's, it's not that expensive. Not that expensive. Not that expensive for the privileged few, to be honest. Mm -hmm. because um, we got to understand that 80% of people with disability who are blind uh, from the, are from extremely but disadvantaged. But it should cost right a lot to make it too, right? I mean, it doesn't cost. Uh, yeah. It costs 40 bucks to make it. We have made it, but however, because of patents and all these issues, we can't really make it or sell it. But it, we know how much it costs to make it. It costs 40 bucks. And uh, So do you have any supplements? No vitamin D, vitamin... No, 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 no supplements. No supplements at all. Uh, my diet is just the regular diet, whatever uh, everybody eats, a one square meal. That's it. What are your indulgences? Nothing. So you don't indulge in anything? Like, you're, what have you, have you ever spent on yourself? Yeah, when people force me to buy clothes, yes. Okay. Yeah, they force me to buy clothes. Please note. <laughs> <laughs> or what would you like to in indulge in? Let's ask the other way. I would love to indulge in experiences. So what is the one experience you want to indulge like, in? Like, for example, I would like to do a lot of more, lot more adventure sports uh, around the country, maybe outside our country to experience it. So... Uh, that for sure would be an indulgence. Uh, I would like to travel. I love to travel. So that would be one. And you've and, got uh, many travel stories, right? Uh, travel stories. Yes. And uh, how do you? I mean, how do you encounter when people are like kind of shocked, looking at you traveling? Because I said not many blind people travel. Mm. So how do you handle that? For me, it's a great opportunity to connect and to create awareness and educate. If somebody does approach, does say something, that's a great connect for me to start having a dialogue. And and I see it as that one person going change after that dialogue is that one person. You never know what that person is, who that person is, and what he can do. But he could be your next champion ambassador. He could be your next champion for your cause and go do something. So I speak to every single person like they're going to go out there and change the world. So, Devanshu, you travel very extensively. Tell me some of your travel tales. I'm sure you must be encountering a lot of them. Um, hundred, hundreds of them. There's one, there's one that um, I remember weirdly. I was traveling uh, by Air India. And this time I was really tired and uh, I was coming back after work and I just wanted to be by myself. I was traveling from Delhi to Pune. And there's this gentleman who's sitting beside me. And this gentleman has a booming voice and everybody's saluting him. So I'm like, okay, this guy must be somebody high up and whatever. And I'm praying to myself that he lets me be to myself. But uh, as luck would have it, no. He starts a conversation and he's like, so son, what do you do? Where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. All that happens. 
halfway through the flight, I've had enough coke to keep me awake, and uh, now I want to go pee. So I press the call button, wanting the attendant to come, and so I can use the washroom or go there. And uh, as soon as I press the call button, he's like, "What do you want, son?" I'm like, "No, no, no, nothing, nothing. It's all, it's all good. Just, just need the host." The host comes, and uh, he says to the host, the air hostess, "I will take care of this." Ah, oh, <laughs> uh, and uh, he, I'm say, I, I really need to use the washroom now. So I'm like, okay. And he said, I will take you. And then he proceeds to, he kind of, I, I start marching the aisle, so to speak, with him behind me, giving me <laughs> instructions. And this is an army guy, clearly, with yeah. all his uh, army people, half of the army in the plane. And I'm marching down the aisle with him giving me instructions. Keep right, keep right, all good, all good. And then I go to the washroom. I open the door. He gives me the directions in terms of the layout. And I'm like, thank you very much. Can I please now close the door? <laughs> She's like, no, 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 stand here. I and uh, I'm I'm gonna be right outside. I'm like, okay, then. right outside. So here, imagine this. He's standing outside the washroom. <laughs> I'm standing inside, so the whole plane can see him, hear him, and not only that, he's giving me directions from outside. <laughs> a little to the left, a little to the right, you're doing good, excellent. Well, this must be the most amazing pee you had ever had, I guess. I didn't want to come out, man. I wanted to, like, flush myself down the toilet. <laughs> this is hilarious. You also had a lot of exciting time with some of the arrows, just as you were telling me. Uh, exciting. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you mean, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, well, it, it's very interesting yeah. because often they don't. If I'm traveling with, let's say, somebody with me, then they wouldn't talk to me. They'll talk to the person next to me. They, uh, what will sir eat? <laughs> and I'm like, hello, sir knows what to eat <laughs> because you don't have much choice except a crappy sandwich and a cup of coffee. So you can ask sir. Sir can talk. <laughs> And they get freaked out when I say, uh, you can ask me, you can talk to me, I'm not going to buy it. I'm blind or they, they really scream. Like like the blind supposed to be hard of hearing or something. And they are talking so loudly until you tell them, I'm blind. I'm not deaf. I can hear you. Or the minute you ask for special assistance, the first thing that comes is a wheelchair. Because the universal sign of disability is a wheelchair. And they, and they get offended if you say, I'm blind, I'm not going to use a wheelchair. Thank you very much. They're like, wheelchair laya, abhi, abhi kya karogi? So then, my bags have to go on the wheelchair. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sitting on the wheelchair, my bags will go on the wheelchair. Well, they, they don't know you are a mountaineer, a trekker, and they're going to put you in a wheelchair. That's ridiculous. Because the minute you say disability, that's the universal symbol. That needs to change, probably. Because for them, disability equals wheelchair. wheelchair. Yeah. And you must be in a wheelchair. That's it. Or or even more funnier is when I ask them, uh, so if there is an emergency and the plane's on fire, when will you come for me? And now that puts them in a very difficult position because they say, we're going to come for you last. Last? Last. Why is that? That's the protocol. So I'd say, oh, so you mean there's going to be a blazing fire and I'm going to wait for you and you're going to come. That's right, you're going to come. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you're, you're, you're pulling your leg now. But that's the fact. That's the fact. Is that, that a is, person with disability will be rescued last? That's the protocol. So now that you've been doing all these adventures, you're meeting corporates, you're doing all these various activities, are you seeing a difference in attitude versus before and now? In a limited way, definitely. In all the in in the amount of circle that I have, I'm seeing phenomenal change. Phenomenal change. And that's what motivates me. That's what reinforces me to continue to do this work. Because if in the past two years we've created hundreds of jobs, we've created scholarships, we've got a whole host of writers, scribes to write papers, we've got a whole host of people to record books for us, we've got people to come and tutor persons with disability, we've got more accessible travel across the country, we, um, so there's so many things that have happened because of uh, 
these interactions or large organizations making their stores accessible making their workplaces accessible all have started happening simply because of these two years of interaction I also see that you are very very active on your phone and you use your phone of course without a screen uh tell me how do you use Siri so much i mean Siri seems to be your your really be- best friend yeah my laptop my cane and my phone are three most important gadgets i can't do without they have to be with me phone again it's very, very it makes me stay connected so it's accessible it's an iphone completely accessible i mean we have exchanged whatsapp messages text messages we have spoken on the phone several times so how do you use the phone so my phone is no different to any other regular iphone so you go into iphone there is a setting under general i call it accessibility you just go into accessibility turn voice over on and there you are your phone starts to talk to you and it becomes completely accessible for me because now it's reading out what is on the active screen so it can be icons it can be applications like for example i want to book an uber i can book an uber independently or you send me a whatsapp message i can uh read and write and send you a text back everything that you do in a phone i can do on my iphone the same way in the same iphone just one feature that the company has built in as universal design if if you had a wish for any app or any other feature any tech company had to build what would that be i would uh, the the one one thing i would like technology to to really and it's going towards that but that technology needs to mature more is image recognition once that starts happening like if you notice facebook has started doing that now it starts describing images to you so it says two people outdoors close up it tells me that much and there's a lot of work happening on image recognition yes. by the way yes there's a lot of work yeah. that's happening in that area once that technology matures then it can also tell me here's a photograph of vishal in uh and he's in the outdoors or vishal is in the outdoors looking really happy that'd be amazing yeah, and and the good news is i don't think so we are far away from that i've already seen mm-hmm. a lot of ai which can right. do it and i think in a matter of maybe a few years mm-hmm. this would happen right for sure any other any other piece of tech you'd want apart from image recognition for now that's the biggest challenge image recognition because i already have uh, uh, technology that helps me stay completely independent this is really nothing i miss i'm absolutely independent so for example um if it's a bottle at home and, and i don't know the label i want to read the label i've got kind of a reader and just i just point my phone to it and it reads out the label ocr instant ocr or there's a letter or something printed i just instant do see it or i want to know what color of my shirt how do i know i'm wearing a white shirt today because i know it's a white shirt because i use color recognition so i just have to point my phone and tell me what color my shirt is what color my jeans are technology is really amazing the other technology i would like to see is maybe we could have more of braille technology coming in and and lower end braille technology uh, lower end as in more more affordable braille technology for example braille printers are very expensive that's something that I mean, braille make. books are very bulky very bulky and very expensive to make plus they have to be published over and over again because as you keep reading them the braille embossing goes goes flat so instead of that if you can have refreshable bra- braille displays or if you can just have audio books or audio books but what happens is p- different people have different modes of learning like some people are visual learners some are auditory learners some are kinesthetic learners so you have to have formats different formats available for different people some i would get very bored and very sleepy listening to an audio book because it's so slow mm-hmm. so when i read my my book i read e books because i can control the speed so i go through a 600 page book in what about 2 days whereas with the audio book my god it'll take 2 months so you have to have all formats available you can't just say this is the only format and uh, but if you have braille refreshable uh, uh like like just imagine an ipad but it's a refreshable braille ipad then there's no longer the need for publishing a book so tell me something had on your 19th birthday literally you had not gone blind and if you had just led a normal life 
will you have still done all these things? Have you ever thought about that? I often think about it. You can never tell. You can never tell what the next moment is going to be. So, do you plan ahead or you do you live with the moment? Both. <laughs> I do plan, but I but I absolutely also live in the moment. And I go and I do allow for things to happen in a way that they have to unfold. It's 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 very complicated to answer that question for me. Because who would have thought? Who would have thought ten years ago that I've become a pilot? Or all of these things. I didn't. I don't know. I never really. I never knew. If you if you ask me at the age of nineteen, this is what you're going to end up becoming. No, I didn't ever dream of that. But if you ask me before nineteen, what did I really envision? I always saw myself in the mountains helping people fall in love, and that's what I'm doing again. That's what I'm doing exactly right now. Not just helping people fall in love with the outdoors, because I believe God is in the outdoors, but also helping them fall in love with themselves. Also helping them believe in themselves. Also helping them make this world a better place. So, as you know, there are millions of people with disabilities, and for people who are listening to this show, if there is one message you want to tell, what would that be? Just believe in yourself. Don't let the world decide for you. No matter what, we we really have to start learning to imagine possibilities. If if you're faced with this thing that says you know oh but it's impossible, ask yourself what makes it impossible. What can what can we do to make it possible? What different do we have to do? So, so basically, challenge is the status quo. Whatever Absolutely. they have been told to do, they should not be doing. They should be Absolutely. challenging and wanting to do exactly what the opportunities others have and ask for that. Yes, ask for evidences and question why and go keep asking why. And you realize that uh, you just need to think. You, this is what Einstein said, and that was very interesting. That you can't uh, solve the problem from the same level of thinking that created it. So if you think it's a problem, then shift your level of consciousness to see what can solve it. That's where the solution is. Rephrase the problem. So if you tell me how fast a cycle can go, then most people would say a human pedal powered cycle would go what 100 kilometers per hour, 120. 150. How much? How how fast can you pedal a cycle? What's the fastest? Well, certainly not 100. Maybe less than that. Less than that, yeah. right? Now, what if you were to ask yourself, what's the fastest it can go? Maybe you say 150, right? But what about why? Why can't it go to 300 kilometers per hour? Because that's where our mind stops working, right? We we say. No. So if it can go hundred, it's going hundred. Great. What is helping it to go hundred? And what can I change? What needs to change if it has to go beyond hundred? So, so how much of how much credit do you give to others to help you achieve where you have reached, or you say, or you have achieved this pretty much on your own? You do need support. Like for example, I couldn't have become a pilot without the support of my team. Without the support of my instructor, we believed in each other. They believed in me, and I believed in them, and we trusted each other with our lives. Any one of them making a mistake, I for sure would be dead. But we trusted each other, and and you need you need people, uh, you need support, you need people who believe in you. But it's also your responsibility to make people believe in you. You can't sit and complain that nobody believed in me, and hence I'm a failure. That's crap. If nobody believed in you, then you need to go out there and help them. But, but do you also come across people who take advantage of you or do something which is not right? Yeah, they've taken advantage. They've conned me, but that's simply because I've let them or I've just been stupid. Can you give me an example of that? How did they? How did somebody con me? Like, like just last time I came to Bombay, I had great trouble finding a cab. I was coming here in a rush, so I. Um, I had some difficulty finding a cab. Finally, I found a cab, and I, I said, "You have to drop me here. Uh, you have to drop me to South Bombay." And I paid him the money. And he said, uh, "I can't drop you to South Bombay, but I'll drop you to Washi, and from there you'll, you'll be able. I'll ensure that I put you in another cab, who will take you to South Bombay, and all of this in the same amount of money. We fixed the deal." I said, "Great." And then at Washi, he puts me in another cab. And uh, everything is nice until ten minutes later. This cab driver says that I have not been paid money. 
I'm like, what? But the deal was that he was supposed to pay. I'm like, why? he was supposed to pay you, not me. He's like, he told me, you're supposed to pay me. I'm like, brilliant, we both have been. <laughs> so, yeah, that does happen. That, but that happens very rarely, very, very rarely. Or, for example, sometimes you don't sign a contract or you don't sign something and people take you for a ride. But that happens in normal life. In normal, yeah. exactly, in business. And that's just because you're being stupid or you, you think that this person will not do it, but they end up doing it for whatever reasons. And you live and you learn and that's just the way it is. So, for example, last cycling expedition, uh, one of the sponsors had promised that they'll get us a cycle. And the cycle never arrived. But but you still went ahead and did it anyways. Yeah, because I got my friends from UK and Germany to get together in UK. I bought a second-hand cycle on eBay and they actually got that cycle from UK to India. And it was a adventure getting that cycle here. And that cycle was not meant for those roads in Manali to Khardunla. The cycle broke down after four days. Literally, the bottom bracket came out. The frame broke. We had to hammer the frame in with our feet every 15 minutes for the next five days. Now, every time I hammered it in, I, of course, kicked myself and mentally kicked the sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. That's, that's life. part of life. Plan. That's part of yeah. life. That's just all right. I you must say, about it. I, I must say, Divyanshu, this has been possibly one of the most exciting time of my life talking to you. You're so inspiring. And I think uh, I'm taking away two big lessons from this. And I hope everybody else. In fact, there are lots of lessons from your story. But I think the biggest thing is that the disability is in your mind. Absolutely. As a human, you are achieved, you are born to do the impossible. You are born to do just about everything. It's just your mind which is stopping you. And I think you proved that. And the other thing is also challenging the status quo. Mm. I think people have already defined things for, for you. That you know, if you have to grow up, if you are a doctor, your son needs to be a doctor. If you are an engineer, you need to be an engineer. If you are you know, a teacher and so on. So I think the problem is society and has already defined the set of path for most people. And most people are trying to follow that. But the reality is that it is challenging this status quo, which can make you do the impossible and make you a super achiever. And I think your journey from uh, literally being in the darkness to being on literally top of the world at Khardungla and now with all your other plans, uh, wishing you amazing luck and success. And uh, uh, we are surely going to be in touch and going to figure out a way how we are going to help you in achieving your dreams. But it has been a pleasure, Divyanshu. It's been a pleasure. Thanks Thank a lot. So much. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, everybody. Excuse me, bhaiya. Excuse me. Bole, madam. Menu me kya hai? Menu me seen and seen hai, podcast hai, on course hai, Cyrus hai, Made in India, Rediscovery Project, Empowering Series, Sex Vex hai, IBM Likes hai, Simplified hai, Keeping It Queer hai, Things and Destinations hai, My Neighbor Zuckerberg hai, or The Fan Garage hai. Aapko kya chahiye hai? Uh, ek baar repeat kar denge kya? Repeat, repeat nahi karta hum. Aap jao, ibmpodcast.com pe aur suno ye sab. Ya fir download karo unka app. Sab aapke ungliyo pe.